and welcome to Unity Presbyterian Church Online. This week in worship, Pastor David continues our series on relationships with a look at what it takes to be a godly neighbor. Let's listen. Continue this series on relationships. We're in week four of our summer series, and today the relationship that we will study is how can we be a godly neighbor? There's a quote from theologian uh, G.K. Chesterton who says this, The Bible tells us to love our neighbors and also to love our enemies, probably because generally they are the same people. I really hope that this quote does not describe your neighbors. I mean, for me personally, uh, here in Denver, I have been blessed with some really incredible neighbors, uh, neighbors that I just cherish living beside. But I know that that's not true for everybody. Uh, perhaps you have had an experience either currently or in the past where you don't really get along with your neighbor very well. You don't enjoy living next to your neighbors. I, I heard a, a story once from someone who was living in an apartment complex. I think this was in New York City. And he said that once a week, he would sweep the stairwell of his apartment complex just because he thought it would be nice to, to live in a, a place that looked clean and, and fresh. Well, one week he was in the elevator with one of his neighbors. And his neighbor said, hey, are you the one who sweeps the stairwell? And the man responded, yeah, yeah, that's me, thinking, oh, good, my neighbor's going to thank me for doing something so kind for our communal area. But instead, the man said, I wish you wouldn't do that. It really uh, irritates me when you move the rugs and make them no longer lie flat. And that was it. He didn't say thank you, nothing else, just kind of a snarky comment towards his neighbor. Yes, perhaps you've had experiences like that before as well, where you don't quite see eye to eye with the people you are living around. But I hope you can think of other times where you really cherish the people who live next to you, where you freely choose to share your life with people. Maybe you watch over their home while they're away, and, and they are the people that, that you can really talk to. Whether you go on walks through your neighborhood or check in the mail, they're, they're who you do life beside and around. Yes, we probably all have definitions and experiences of good and bad neighbors. Today, we're going to study what does the Bible say about our neighbors? These are the people we live in proximity to. We are around so much of our life with. And so what does the Bible say about a neighborly relationship? We're going to study a section of Scripture where it comes right after God has liberated his people from slavery, from 400 years of, ca of captivity, and he takes his people out into the desert and then begins to teach them how they're going to be a new community. Yes, he is going to form them into something new, and in the midst of doing that, he begins to teach them, this is how you are to act, right? This is the sort of community you're going to be. This is what you're going to be known for. And, and within that teaching, he tells them, and this is how you are to treat your neighbors. So we're going to take a look at that scripture. Uh, many of these commands for this new community that's being formed by God, we can find in the book of Leviticus. And we're going to study a section of Leviticus in chapter 19 that speaks specifically to what type of uh, or how they should treat their neighbors. So let's go ahead and uh, start. We'll start in chapter 19, verse 13, and we're going to read a, a, a pretty good chunk of scripture. I want you to pay attention to how many times you see the word neighbor. It begins in this way. God says, do not defraud or rob your neighbor. Do not hold back the wages of a hired worker overnight. Do not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block in front of the blind, but fear your God. I am the Lord. Do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor, or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and do not do anything 
that endangers your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. I hope you see that this new community that God is creating, how you treat your neighbor is of utmost importance to God. Let's go ahead, and I, we went through those pretty quickly, and so let's briefly look at some of the ways that God wants that community, that people of Israel that he's forming, to treat their neighbors. I mean, first he says, do not rob or defraud your neighbor. And then he gives an example. He says, if you hire a day laborer, make sure to pay them that day. Don't withhold the wages overnight because your neighbor is going to be in need of those wages to feed his family. And so don't rob or defraud the people that you're living around. God goes on to say that this community that I'm forming will be known for how it cares for those with disabilities within the community. And so do not mock someone who cannot hear you. And do not put a stumbling block in front of someone who cannot see. No, we need to be known for caring for the disadvantaged who live in our community. Now, that seems like common sense to us, but 4,000 years ago, that was pretty revolutionary for the type of community God was creating. God says in this community, we are to seek justice and not favoritism within our justice system so that your neighbor can be judged fairly. In fact, do not do anything that would endanger your neighbor's life. And finally, God says, and do not withhold or, or, or hold any hate in your heart for your neighbor. If you find that you have a grudge against someone that is just silently burning you up, you need to go and talk with that person openly, frankly, authentically, so that there is not even an invisible wall between you and your neighbor. Yes, God is listing all sorts of, of ways that we are to treat our neighbors in a variety of different circumstances and contexts. What's kind of fun is that in the next verse, what we're going to find out is that all of these commands, everything that God just listed about how to treat your neighbor can be summarized in one command. That's right. You don't have to go and memorize this list in Leviticus so that you can say, okay, in this circumstance, this is how I'm supposed to treat my neighbor. No, all of these commands can be summarized in one command. Let's read about what that command is. In the next verse, God says, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Yes, all of the rules of Leviticus that speak about your neighbor are summarized in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Because if you love your neighbor as you love yourself, then all of the other things that God has already listed will then follow suit quite naturally. You won't rob or defraud your neighbor. You won't endanger your neighbor's life simply because you would not want your neighbor— to rob or defraud you. You wouldn't want your neighbor to endanger your life, and so you would treat them in the same way that you want to be treated. You love your neighbor as if your neighbor was yourself. So who is my neighbor? Well, in this context, in the community that, that God is forming, your neighbor is anyone in this new community, which means all of the people of Israel. Uh, we, uh, at least I, when I think of a neighbor, I, I think first of the person living to my right and my left. You know, those are my neighbors. But God's expanding that definition a little bit to say, say, no, it's everybody that lives in your community. Everybody in this community that I'm forming, all of those people are your neighbor. You are to love all of them as you love yourself. Let's begin to apply that principle to our lives today. So I want you to go ahead and picture your neighborhood. 
or your street that you live on. Wherever you live in Denver or wherever you're watching from, what does your neighborhood look like? As you drive around it or you walk your street, what do the houses look like? What do your neighbors look like? And then imagine, what would your neighborhood be like if everybody fulfilled this command? If everybody loved one another, loved their neighbor as they loved themselves, how would that transform your neighborhood? Yes, and when we talk about loving your neighbor, we really do mean all of your neighbors. And that includes the neighbor that doesn't really take very good care of their yard and kind of brings down the whole neighborhood. It includes the neighbor that really should get a new muffler on their car but doesn't seem to, to hear it when they drive past. It, it even includes the neighbor that drives way too fast down your road and you're always thinking, think of the kids, slow down, yes. We are to love all of our neighbors as we love ourselves. Let's just be honest here for a second. That's a really hard command. I mean, isn't it? Because to love your neighbor as yourself, I mean, can there be a higher calling than that? Personally, when I think of the challenges that come with fulfilling that command, I think a, a big one is, is simply because we are created with a pretty intense self-preservation instinct, aren't we? I mean, we are, are wired to think of ourselves first and foremost. And to love your neighbor as you love yourself, it pushes against the heart of that instinct. So to fulfill this command, it will not come naturally. It must be done intentionally. But again, can you imagine if your entire neighborhood embraced this? I mean, how would that transform the place that you live? Yes, the type of community that God is seeking to create here early in the Old Testament is built upon the belief that your needs are as important as my needs. And because of that, we all need to work together towards a, a common purpose to create the neighborhood, the world that we are seeking to live in, to create it well. But what about that town down the road? I and mean, what about that, that, that town, one town over, that's full of people that are not quite like us, that don't really look like us or maybe share the same values as us? I mean, what about the, the people we consider maybe outsiders? not the ones in our direct community. I mean, who is my neighbor? God understood that a community can take that same sort of self-preservation instinct to take care of itself first, much like an individual can. And when communities do that, they then become insular to say, well, we care about us but them, well, they're kind of outside of, of us, and so we're not really worrying about them. Yes, I think God realized that a community can easily begin to view others who are not in the community as outsiders. I think that's why just a little bit after the command that we just read, to love your neighbor as yourself, just a little bit after that, we read these words. And when a foreigner residing among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself. For you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Who is my neighbor? Well, it's that direct community, right? It's my neighborhood that we are a part of, but God is now expanding that definition to include those that we wouldn't necessarily think would fit in our neighborhood, who might be considered the other or the outsider. They, too, are our neighbors. In this time period, Israel actually had quite a few non-native people who were living in their community, and what we find when we study this time period is that they often did not know uh, the, the laws or customs of the land as well. And so they were taking advantage of at a much higher rate 
than those who knew the customs, knew uh, the way that we generally do things, you know, in the nation of Israel. But God makes it clear that they too are your neighbors, and so you are to love them as you love yourself. Let me give you a modern-day example of what that might look like. Uh, In Tampa, I was the chair of the board of directors of a nonprofit called the Beth L. Farm Workers Ministry. And this was a neat ministry. It it was out in uh, the Ruskin area, which is a rural area of Florida, and the purpose was to serve farm workers, to to serve them food, uh, to serve them opportunities, uh, clothing, sometimes uh, free dental care or health care. It was to serve the farm working population. Because in Florida, especially central Florida, there was a large group of migrant farm workers um, who would work uh, long, long hours in the hot Florida sun picking the crops then that we could easily go to the supermarket to buy and benefit from. Well, what this nonprofit found that I was working with was that often uh, these farm workers came from Mexico, uh, did not speak English yet, and then were at risk, pretty high risk, of being taken advantage of uh, when they were now in America. And one of the primary ways we saw this taking place was that some of the farmers would have the the hired uh, farm workers who they paid a very, very small wage to, they would have them live in a trailer on their property. But the trailer was was generally very run down, and they would fit maybe eight or ten people all in this one little run-down trailer in, in the middle of Florida. And then to make matters worse, they would charge a pretty exorbitant amount of rent to the farm workers, even though they've made very, very little from that back-breaking work. And this then perpetuated the cycle of poverty and did not allow then the farm workers ever to work their way out of this situation of poverty. Well, to this board of directors, that was was a, a classic example of taking advantage of the foreigner living among you. I mean, when I personally saw a family of eight living in this small, rundown trailer, I had to ask myself, would I be satisfied if that were my family? And if I was living there with my kids? And the answer, obviously, was a resounding no. And so then I thought, well, then I need to treat them as I would want to be treated. And I need to work on their behalf like I would hope someone would work on my behalf if I was in their situation. That is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Do you see how God is expanding on this definition of who your neighbor is? Not only is it those who are in your direct community, but it is also expanded to include those who you may have once considered an outsider. Treat the foreigner as if they were a native-born Love them as yourself, for you were foreigners once in Egypt. So who is my neighbor? Well, Jesus continues to expand this definition. Yes, there is once a story uh, of Jesus, and and he is approached by a person who asks him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus responded, well, you, you know the law. What does it say? And the man replied, well, there's, there's two commandments that kind of summarize the whole law. The first is, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and strength. Hey, and if you recognize that one, it's because that's what we studied last week. That's the Shema, right? This foundational commandment to love God with all that you are. So the man says, there's that. And then he also quotes what we just studied in Leviticus, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus looks at him and says, yeah, you got it. You do those two things, those two commands that that summarize pretty much the essence of our faith, and you'll be just fine. You will inherit eternal life. But the man wasn't satisfied with that answer. I think because the man realized it's really hard to love your neighbor. 
particularly if your neighbor could be considered anyone, I mean, that's a pretty expansive definition. Can't we narrow that in a little bit, this man must have thought? I mean, can't we restrict it a little bit into just my kind of general circle? That, that makes it easier to fulfill this command to love my neighbor as myself. And so that's why the man responds to Jesus and says, well, who's my neighbor? Because he's looking for a more narrow definition, something more manageable to inherit eternal life. And do you remember how Jesus responds? He responds with a story. He says, I'll tell you who your neighbor is. He tells this story of a man who was beaten up and left for dead on the side of the road. And the most likely people to help that man saw him and walked on the other side of the road and left him for dead. But then the most unlikely man, a Samaritan, sees him, and he puts himself in his place. He loves him like a neighbor, and he cares for him. He tends to his needs. He brings him to a place to stay and pays for his needs. Yes, he loves him like a neighbor. He loves him like he would love himself. And at the end of that story, Jesus asked the man, so who was a neighbor to the person who was in need? And the man replies, well, it was the one who showed mercy to him. And what does Jesus say? He says it to the man. He says it to us. He says, so go and do likewise. Do you see what Jesus has done here? When we say, who is my neighbor? It's not only our direct community, our neighborhood. It's not only then those who are once considered outsiders, the foreigners living among us. No, now Jesus has made this a universal principle. All of humanity may be considered your neighbor, and you are to love your neighbor as yourself. How would that change the world if we all did this? I mean, if if truly, if, if even just every Christian in the world did this, and viewed one another like this, how would that change the world? These, to love the Lord your God with every part of you, and to love your neighbor as yourself, this is the foundation of our faith. Jesus says everything can be summarized in these two commands. That's why I love, I love that our church is opening up its manse to a refugee family in need, a a family who has nowhere to go, because that family is our neighbor. That's why I love that this church is actively talking with the African-American churches in our community to learn from them and advocate on their behalf, because they are our neighbor. I love that this church is seeking to fulfill this ancient command that summarizes the very essence of our faith. Love your neighbor as yourself. I encourage you, do everything possible in your life to fulfill this command. Yes, everything within your purview, within your kind of system of influence, can you bend it towards this direction? to say, I will live in such a way that I view all people as my neighbor, and I will seek to love them as if they were myself. Amen. If you would like more information about Unity Presbyterian Church, please visit our website at www.unitypres.org or visit us on Facebook. This is the Unity Presbyterian Church Podcast. Have a great week.